What's up guys? What is up? It's Shani with Healing Elements and I am going to try something different today. I'm going to try to form a playlist of archetypal energies or traits, the attributes, the signs, symbols, meanings, things of that nature, the archetype. Um, I am going to start off and you have to tell me if you do like them, I'll do more. I really appreciate you guys. This is all about the mermaid. The mermaid archetypal energies and what the mermaid has represented in past um, tense and cultures and obviously what it has become because it is one of the archetypes that changed throughout history based on the patriarchy and so the mermaid archetype we of course affiliated with water element so I'll go through a couple of bullet points just some main themes and then we'll go over them in detail and talk about again some cultural um, tidbits where they think the first mention of the mermaid was, etc. So again, thanks for being with me, and I hope you guys enjoy this video all about the archetype of the mermaid. Shout out to all of you fellow Pisces. So when we talk about the mermaid's energy or archetype, um, we have to mention magic, you know, magical gifts, abilities, psychic skills. This is all about the water element. Again, water is fluid. Water has to do with diving deep and intuitive guidance, psychic ESP sensitivity, things of that nature that is a very deep understanding that goes beyond what most people are aware of because we all have the gifts, right? Um, playfulness and joy, a abundant energy that has to do with childlike innocence, a love and affinity for unusual or foreign items, things, places, a very healthy beautiful excitability and attraction to things that are interesting that have never been explored before. So there's an exploration, explorer vibe um, with this archetype of the mermaid. There's also, we have, you know, the quality of being very alluring, attractive, magnetic, you know, having a very dominant or attractive or somehow attention um, getting presence about you, you know, whether that is your presence or your physical appearance or your charisma there is something that draws people to you you know is the emphasis on a duality or dichotomies um having things that are equal parts light and dark you know uh, polarities um you know things that we can choose how to use in opposite forms and learn lessons and and come to a consensus on how to go in the middle right meet in the middle and have a balance between such, I guess, right and left wing type of uh, principles, right? So there's a curiosity when we talk about this energy and elusiveness being very hard to catch, slippery like a fish, like elusive. Um, attachments, loving things to the point of worship, almost like a fangirl type of vibe. Um, these are historical meanings. These are things that are generally associated with the archetype. Did a lot of research on it. This is also my interpretation weaved in here. So I just wanted to be clear with that as we go on. Um, there is, again, with the psychic energy and the connection to water, there's a strong connection to anything spiritual. So feelings of physical you know, pains or sensations when walking into old buildings or places, things of that nature, deja vu, remembrances, probably could be advanced into all kind of things, right? You yourself could be a QHT. Um, hypnosis therapist. So you are in tune with water element if you resonate with the archetype of the mermaid. It's the fluidity of life, right? Water, when we talk about water. At the same time, it can be, you know, like a typhoon or waterfall, like Niagara Falls or the Colorado River that cuts through the canyon, right? It can also be one of the toughest things that there is. It's so powerful. It's fierce. The force can bring down people thousands of people can die through a tsunami or a flood right so we have these polarities even in when we talk about other uh, traits and qualities and attributes associated so the water element <clears throat> just as it is a renewer it is a bringer again of life of sustenance it allows not only your thirst to be quenched and for survival it allows for the new sustenance the substance that you plant in the ground to grow because you have to have water for any of us to be alive. So it's a uh, big archetype with the mermaid does have to do with we could not live without blank, right? We could not live without water 
Okay. I know a lot of you can't live without the beautiful mermaid. So the dichotomy of water, I think is, um, that water element and, and the polarities is very, very intriguing to me because being a water sign, being a Pisces, as I mentioned, it's definitely true. I think that water signs are just the water element. When we talk about deep emotions and passion, there is this sense of gentleness and forcefulness. There's a sense of sanity and beautiful eloquence and also goofiness and complete crazy, right? So it's something that is non-forgiving, right? It's the bringer of death sometimes and the bringer of life. So again, this is looking at things not salty or sweet, not black or white, but equal parts, right? The polarities work well with each other. And this is interesting because when we talk about uh, the mermaid being half woman and half fish, uh, one of the very first mentions um, I did research on Google, one of the very first mentions, I guess historians say that is of the mermaid is in um, Syria in 1000 BC. And it is a story in which um, this goddess jumps into a lake and transforms into a fish. And then the kings said, no, you know what? You were too fine. You were too beautiful just to be a fish. And she wanted to be a fish and embody that. And uh, the patriarchy <laughs> actually said, we will grant you half. So that story is one of which historians say is um, the first mention. I myself believe in things that are tens of thousands of years back, but you know, that was what um, the consensus is. So, okay. Beside, you know, um, the patriarchy in that story, just tell you, you know, making it so that she was so beautiful. Oh, we can't waste that on just her wanting to do it she wanted to do, right? She couldn't just make her own decision and be a fish. So the patriarchy and paganism um, meaning here, it just is very important, I think, especially when we talk about um, trying to change things and get equality for gender and for, you know, um, gay rights to be not even considered because everybody should have rights and it shouldn't even be having to be argued about, right? That's nothing of anybody's business. So this uh, patriarchy tie-in with demonizing everything, right? After like the 14th and 15th century, this tie in to make anything that they didn't deem in the church something of paganism, right? Like black cats, etc. So after the 15th century, um, the patriarchy is controlled, like all of the narratives. Again, they demonized simple things, they changed, um, you know. Uh, different things like the Star of David and things that they wanted to create a false narrative of negativity to replace so that they could put power and control over the masses. You know, after the 15th century, they began to understand they could do that with the narrative and the archetype of the mermaid. Okay. So just like they de demonized just about anything, honestly, if they didn't like it, they demonized it. You hung, if you didn't fall for their crap, right? Um, hopefully we're all waking up to that. So the mermaids went from before the 15th century, um, being considered very, very shy, um, demure, very bashful and, and alluring, right? But just in a very innocent, sweet way to being considered to be of a seductress to the church, you know, bold and enticing sailors trying to snare them into their grasp so that they could be in close proximity to them. And, you know, some of the churches thought that this was actually a part of uh, satanic rituals in which they were working with Satan. And, you know, that is why they were such um, seductresses and they were falling into men's arms and men were told to stay away from them because they were told they would fall into the sin of temptation. So this kind of nonsense is patriarchy and paganism really did play a big part. I read on and on a lot of articles, really well written articles from professors and otherwise just on the internet about this whole concept and there was so much I just wanted to go off but there's so many beautiful things that I have to talk about for the mermaid but I just thought that it was um, uncanny that of course you know we could see other things that they they did to twist right twist the the narrative and the all-around meaning or um, you know belief about mermaids they twisted it so completely that they made it to be associated with you know, witchcraft, Satan, Satanism, something that swam in the sea, right? And, and, um, magical, dark energy. And that is completely the opposite. So we'll move on to the beautiful, beautiful 
um, gift that I possess. I love it. I'm very grateful for it. You can do it. It's so cool. You can just practice. Makes perfect. Uh, the mermaid archetype talks about healing with our hands, our hands in particular, using our energy, using the energy that is around us in the auric, our auric field, the field around us, right? The energy, the chi. Using that and concentrating with intent and love and gratitude for the opportunity to do so and for, you know, the love you feel for the party that you're helping. Um, you know, you can call this um, shamanic healing, vibrational medicine, Reiki, massage therapy even. Um, even people who um, are hairdressers, I find, could embody that archetype of the mermaid energy right there because they are using their hands to renew. They're using their hands to fix. They're using their hands to uh, make well again. And it's just a beautiful sensation. The touch is just something that is shared and can create healing, love bonds, so much more. And, um, you know, when we talk about using magical qualities... The mermaid archetype has a meaning to do with using sound, like they presume that was done in um, Atlantis and maybe Egypt, using sound and concentrating on intent with consciousness and sound vibrations to move, you know, large objects and things. Using your thoughtful intention to move something um, that is too heavy for your own body to do. So, and also, you know, just using sound and harmony, singing in a group too, as a healing modality in any way. So I've been using that. It's my favorite flex to just sing with the radio up. If, if I'm home healing, that's what I'm doing. You guys, if you catch this in the video, I will be doing a lot of more videos about what's been going on, my whole sickness. But as I heal and I'm getting, you know, more and more videos uploaded, I have been, you know, after my responsibilities are done, I've been singing and it has been making such a difference seriously about the healing, the vibrations. If you think about it, just like a cat when they purr the vibrations are of a healing nature just like the you know i'm sure you go to the meditative um binaural beats or something on youtube or if you don't there are frequencies that heal our body and it's been scientifically proven but this is a, a magical oral you know um medicinal shamanic thing that was you know something that all mermaids were said to possess so this archetype has to do with um, being a renewing source a positive energy basically and something that radiates and raises the vibe within the entire tribe based on the I guess the bravado the passion and the love that comes out of you in your vibrational frequency when you sing and when you use sound you know healing bowls um, um, you know it heals our physical vessel it makes new healthy cells it regenerates cells right it is a beautiful thing so when we use music and we use singing in our life. I know that I've been enjoying like the past four years. I'm going out at least twice a year. But my daughter got us started, a 25 year old going to karaoke bars. It's so fun. It's Korean karaoke bar. And it just always feels like such a, uh, you know, a, a church type of or a sacred experience to have the joy of singing. I love to dance too, but that's um, another issue. It's just um, the archetype of the mermaid can use singing and music in itself to bridge gaps and to connect with others um, as a joyful experience and, you know, um, a renewal of healing mental space, maybe arguments, things like that. So very much of a, a, a neutral, soothing, serene energy when we talk about the mermaid archetype. Think about how beautiful and elegant they look when they're under the water swimming. It's just that very intoxicating, almost like a, a meditation in a vision, right? Kind of vibe. So, um, again, the, you know, demonization of the mermaid after the 15th century, yeah, it, it was, as I explained, but it also I found it to be somewhat of a demonization that the church and the patriarchy um, now objectified the mermaid. So not only did they make this, you know, narrative new and negative and have some really strange things it had to of course come with a really sexy and, and it wanted to be sexy and lure you in to come into you know her arms and get trapped and fall into bed and never come back right so this is i think the objectification it's just women being objectified as objects to pine over and or be the scapegoat be the one that is kind of um, to blame, quote unquote, right? I found that to be very interesting um, tie into for me. And I think that, 
you know, prior to the patriarchy's change of this, right, prior to the 14th and 15th century, again, remember the, the mermaid was considered pure. It was considered something of a bashful, shy um, archetype. And as a matter of fact, they were, before the 14th century, considered a half virgin woman at that, and half fish being very pure and one of fertility and virility um, symbol of that, and was, you know, considered to be very childlike and innocent because they are not yet at that stage of, you know, being anywhere near to sensual or sexual. It's just after the, again, the church and the patriarchy just went crazy with power control and demonizing everything they could get their hands on, you know, it's portrayed by the church to be a form of sin. So, you know, um, it was deemed that they were in cahoots with Satan, which was the far opposite of the truth. Um, those two visuals and two essence can be far from different. So just like the contrast of what mermaids represent, um, you know, the mermaids before then and now after the 15th century, um, those two things are completely opposing oxymoron forces, right? It's just completely different dichotomies. So another, I think, really important uh, thing to mention when we're talking about the mermaid archetype is being misunderstood, misrepresented, right? Mislabeled, as we just talked about. When things are mysterious in life, we misinterpret things in life. If we misunderstand things in life, sometimes fear begins to creep in because we hear a lot of banter. Uh, we see a lot of things nowadays on the internet. We don't know what opinion to listen to. Not me, but some people get in a frenzy to try to you know, surround themselves with the notion of they're going to get to the bottom of what this mystery or misunderstood or perhaps, you know, um, changed narrative type of subject is, in this case, the mermaid. And because there's so many opposing hypotheses about what the truth is about this, right? Fear breeds and fear creeps in and it then makes it easier for these people of power to control, honestly. And um, if the subjects are constantly under this, I guess, uh, self-destructive, um, self-talk, self, you know, a very insecure place because they are being accused, like the witches, shout out, um, of doing something that is absolutely nonsense, of being representative of something that they are opposite of, right? Um, they can then take this into be uh, a, a very timid, very nervous, scared, maybe fleeting, maybe jittery, and maybe a little bit um, jumpy energy. And it just, I wanted to leave off with that because I wanted to mention how much of a metaphor I think it was when I was talking about the whole persecution type of vibe and also um, assuming half people in the world or whatever, half people assuming one thing because they were told a narrative and the others knowing the truth and the real oral history as oral history, right? It almost reminds me of these days, the way the youngsters talk about Google. If you ever say a fact of all kind, you know, the first thing they're going to say is, oh, well, let me Google that. And what is to say, honestly, I know all of you have thought about this. It's like, what is to say that pretty soon, or if not already now, Mandela effect, whatever you want to say, they will put whatever answer they want you to know and think about these kids because they know they go right to the Google, right? So it's funny to me. I told them, no, my mind is my Google. And if not a library or, or look on the website into like a library of Congress, don't just take some WW whatever <laughs> website and, and, you know, find out these things based on just what someone said, if it's not anything that is a consensus. So I think when we talk about the internet coming around and kind of replacing, right, and being a different narrative, like, oh, you can trust us. It's it's comparative to what happened with the mermaid. It's just complete polar opposites between, you know, the old school, just feeling the oral histories with Native Americans and any kind of tribal cultural experience in which you express these, you know, healing te techniques and different things verbally in oral histories rather than having to uh, count on anything else because it's it's that essence of sharing that information too that builds the bond stronger and creates a you know an opposite of a generational curse it it, pro it produces a generational healing because we are sharing in the knowledge of how to heal so guys i i know that um I appreciate everything that you are. I appreciate you stopping by. I just wanted to say thank you very much. And again, I will think of other characters or different 
um, beans, anything that I can do to um, try to beef up and do some more videos for this archetypal energy playlist. We'll see how it goes. I will see if I even like it. I'll see if I'm going to post it after I re-listen to it. But thank you so much. I send you nothing but blessings, love, lots and lots of appreciation, and happy new year for 2024, guys. Blessings, love, and light.